Um, it's a very intriguing thing to do international tours and to see what people want from a book. Um, in England, people want a book that they can chew. They want steak. You know, they want a steak dinner, something that's meaty, that's thick, that they are, um, are constantly able to discuss with others. A lot of people in America want a bee treat, uh, a romance novel, not that there's anything wrong with any of those. I think they're all great at different times when we, we want to read them. But there is this sense of, I don't want to do any work while I'm reading. I just want to be whisked away. I want it to be pure fluff that, interestingly, I think originated in this country and then spread a little outside its borders. So it's not that I think we underestimate the reading public. What I think we do is underestimate the value of commercial fiction in this country. And there is a real difference between um, those two things. Because I believe lots of people read lots of different things. There are times that I am going to pick up a Jeffrey Eugenides book, and then there are times I'm going to pick up a Jennifer Weiner book. You know, it, it depends on what I'm in the mood for. But I'm going to read both of them, and they're both on my bookshelves. Um, however, there is a tendency in America to assume that anyone who writes commercial fiction must be writing ultimate crap. And I don't believe that at all. I think some of the best writing in this country comes particularly from women writers who have been overlooked uh, by review outlets like the New York Times. Um, and it's just assumed if you're a female writer, you must be writing chiclet. So why would we bother to even consider that there was any brain thought put behind your words? Um, I don't know why that is. I know that it's been, it's been borne out in proof. Someone, Vita, actually crunched the numbers and saw that, yes, actually, women are reviewed less frequently in most review um, papers and, uh, and uh, journals in the US. Um, I don't know why we believe that, that people who write commercial fiction have nothing to say. I also think that I'm lying to you in a, bit, a little bit because there is some commercial fiction that is total crap. There's no question about it. But there's a lot that's not. And the thing that I'm, I, I mean to say is, you look at someone like, for example, Ann Tyler. Ann Tyler is a very literary author. She's always billed herself as a literary novelist. She writes about the relationships between men and women and families. I don't really know why that's different from what I do, but I'm a commercial writer. And it's a very arbitrary distinction, one that I think we should completely erase. Labels are not good. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much for coming. I've been hugely inspired. So oh, thank, thank you. you. So I'll ask one if there's no other questions. <laughs> which is, do you think you're treated different as a female author than you would be as a male author? This is something that a lot of atheist writers have complained about, that the male writers get more attention than the female writers. I wonder if you experienced this. Um, I'm really lucky. You know, I'm not complaining. I'm in a great place. I have lots of readers. My books sell. You know, I don't have to work at Home Depot to supplement my career. It's all good. So I, I have no right to complain about anything. But I also make it a point to try to help new authors to, um, to really champion particularly female authors who are not getting reviews, uh, because that's how you hear about books. It's through what other people say about them. Um, so although I've been really lucky, because I do get reviews, and particularly in huge commercial outlets like People Magazine, like Entertainment Weekly, even the New York Times, which routinely slams me. I'm like their whipping girl for commercial fiction, but you know, hey, even bad press is good press. You know, but honestly, um, I get coverage. However, a lot of women writers do not get coverage. And really, what I think what upsets me the most about the dichotomy between male and female writers is with male romance writers. That drives me nuts. Because I don't know why it is so extraordinary to believe that you know, someone can write what is an essentially a glorified romance novel. Um, if they happen to have male genitalia. I don't know why that is such a big deal, but we all know there are writers who do it, and they are like, you know, God's gift. On the other hand, you know, they're writing, if it was a woman writing that, it would have someone in a heaving, a, a, you know, the heaving bodice, and it would be a paperback cover. It wouldn't be a hardback novel. So I, I don't really know why that is, but that's a definite fine gender line that you see, um, you know, that manifests itself very clearly in the publishing world. And, uh, and it's an interesting one that's been there for years. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> uh, 
this is going to be a simple question, but I was just wondering, out of all the books you've written, because when people ask me what my favorite book is that's written by you, it's hard for me to answer, but are there any particular books that you like, and, or was there one that was particularly interesting or difficult to find research for? Um, yeah, those are all different questions, but, um, which is good. Uh, my favorite book of mine is Second Glance. Um, because it covers a period of American history that very few people know about when we were in the business of racial hygiene prior to Hitler. Uh, it involves some of the coolest research I've ever done, which was going ghost hunting. And, um, and it was technically a nightmare to write, and I really feel like I nailed it, so it was a great challenge. So for all those reasons, I love that book. And I always say that you are allowed to have a different favorite as long as I wrote it, so that's okay. But. Um, the book that, that, in terms of research, the research that was probably the hardest to get, there were two, two of those. One would have been Plain Truth, which involved finding my way to the Amish. Um, perhaps you've noticed they do a really good job of keeping apart from people. And so getting to a point where I could live with an Amish family for a week was a challenge. Uh, but I, I managed to do it because I'm really persistent. And, um, and I, the information that I got was really a backstage look at what it's like to be Amish. And everything you read in that book is something that I experienced with, ironically, the exception of going to church because they go every other week. See, they don't even go as often as most Christians <laughs> do. And, um, and yet they, uh, I had to sit down with the bishop and the elders to talk about what their ceremonies would look like instead. And... Um, that was very hard. Also hard was getting to uh, in, uh, a family of a Yupik Eskimo for the 10th Circle, um, where that was probably the most physically challenging research that I ever did. It involved getting to um, a, an Eskimo village that was 100 miles north of Akiak, Alaska. So you fly in, first you fly to Anchorage, then you fly to Akiak on a cargo plane, like it's me and loops for dogs, seriously. And then you get off, and there are only six paved streets. Um, in uh, Akiak, and then if you want to go anywhere, you have to take a snowmobile up a frozen river, which gets a highway number in the winter. So here I am in January, you know, on the back of a snowmobile, it was 38 degrees below zero, and, um, and I was going to this guy's house. Um, he's a Yupik Eskimo who invited me in, and I brought him oranges, and he gave me dried salmon jerky, and, you know, we had a, a lovely conversation, but it was not something I get to do on a daily basis, so it was kind of exciting for me. Um, but that was, again, really challenging research. Thank you. Hi. Hi, thank you for coming. I'm also a big fan. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you write about questions that you haven't been able to answer for yourself, so I was wondering uh, more specifically where you draw the inspiration for your characters from and also just what your process is as a writer, um, how you go about starting a novel, what mm -hmm. you do when you get writer's block, that kind of thing. So um, for me, the, you know, I, I start with that what if question. What if this happened? What if this changed? What if I pushed the envelope here? And if I keep thinking about that, and I'm thinking about it for a couple of weeks, it's probably a really good idea for a book. And if I continue to think about it, characters just pop up. I, I get asked all the time, where do you, how do you create the characters? I don't. I just wait for them to start talking to me. And I've long said that the difference between writing and schizophrenia is that I get paid to hear voices, because that's what it's like. You know, they just, they're talking to me, and I'm writing them down. I'm writing down what they say. And so um, the characters manifest themselves in dialogue. And usually after they begin talking to me, they're walking around in the parameters of this, this what if question, creating a plot. And that's the point where I stop and I go, what do I need to know? And I do a boatload of research. I'll do literally sometimes months of research um, before I, I know what I'm writing. Sometimes, like in the situation that I'm in right now, I think I have everything all set and then I t go and talk to a historian who says, oh God, no, that isn't really what happened. You know, and I have to scratch everything in the middle of writing the book and try to redo it. Um, so I usually try to get like 80 or 85% of my research in good shape before I sit down and write. And the way I know I'm ready to write is um, everything's kind of swirling around up there, uh, the research and the voices of the characters, and it touches down literally in a first line. As soon as I know that first line is the right one, that's when I let myself write. It feels like someone letting go of the reins and I'm allowed to go. Um, writer's block is a very interesting question. I do not believe in writer's block. That is because when I started writing, I had young children. And I wrote literally, you know, when Barney was on TV or when they were napping or sitting, waiting for them to get picked up at, um, you know, nursery school, I would take a laptop. And, uh, you know, when you don't have time, you sit down in the time you've got 
and you write. Think about papers that you've written. You know how you have writer's block, and then miraculously, the night before it's due, boom, you managed to write that paper. Fascinating, isn't it? So I really think writer's block is a function of, of time. And you know, if, if you've learned what it's like to have to do something in crunch, period, you know that if you sit down and put something on the page, having something on that page is better than having nothing. You can always edit a bad page, but you can't edit a blank page. So that said, yeah, there are days I get to my office and I really do not want to be there and I don't want to write, but it's my job. It happens to be a job I love, but I'll sit down and I'll write something. And if it's not a particularly smooth writing day, the next day I can go back and fix it. Hi. Um, I was wondering how you put yourself into the minds of characters that maybe you don't necessarily agree with. You've been talking about how um, you don't necessarily agree with the, uh, some of the points of view in your books, but a lot of the times you write in there, you know, in the first person of a certain character. So how do you um, combat maybe writing views that you really don't agree with? It's really hard. You know, it's really hard not just um, to create characters, but to not put yourself into the characters. And that said, sometimes I do. You know, there are little bits and pieces of my life that I drop into parts of the book. And, um, you know, from what I hear from friends and relatives, it's a very weird experience to read something that they told me in confidence, which is now out there. Um, but, you know, it's usually twisted fictionally so that it doesn't make any sense to you anymore. Um, but that said, you know, I, I have to work really hard to be honest because if I'm not honest about someone, a character whose opinions are different from mine, then I am not the writer I want to be, because then I'm telling you what to think. And probably the closest I come to that, I think, is with Sing You Home, because I, I know how I feel about that issue. I'm dead straight on that issue. I, well, that's kind of an <laughs> irony, but, um, but you know, I mean, I, I know exactly what my opinion is about gay rights. And so for me, it's really hard to be able to say, oh, you don't think there should, you know, we should have equal rights for gay couples? Oh, well, okay. I, it's hard for me as a mom and it's hard for me as a human. Um, so it was very hard for me to create somebody like Pastor Clive, who to me is a villain. Uh, Max is easier because I forgive him a little bit. I, I think he's misguided. Um, so in that case, what I do is I do an interview with someone who does have very different beliefs from what mine are. And, you know, I literally take the interview transcript and I look at it and I mark it up with highlighter and I feed it into his mouth in the book. And there's none of me in that character because there couldn't be. It would make my head explode. So instead, I just turn to what people like him would say. <laughs> 